perspective is everything. It shapes the decisions that we make from moment to moment. And our decisions dictate the quality of our lives, the way we raise our families, and they shape the world around us. The perspective we hold is simply the accumulation of all of the information and experiences we have been exposed to throughout our lives. The more limited our exposure to new ideas and experiences, the more limited our understanding of the world and our decision making will be. So, if we want to make better decisions and change our lives and the world we live in for the better, we have to change our perspective. On this podcast, I speak with great thinkers and experts from all fields to get their perspective on this world that we live in and share knowledge and ideas that can help you to live better. There is only one knowing and that is in not knowing. So join me as I go in search of the truth of how this world of ours operates so that we can make better decisions together. I'm David Bell and welcome to Pocket Mastermind. Hey, what's up, everyone? Dave here. Welcome to Pocket Mastermind. Uh, on this episode, I'm talking all things investing with Neil Doig. Uh, we're covering uh, where to, how to get started, things to look out for, things to avoid, uh, all that good stuff. So if uh, investing is something that you are currently interested in learning more about, uh, then this is the episode for you. I uh, hope you enjoy this. If you do, please remember to uh, give us a like, leave a comment, share with your friends. Um, and with that, let's get on with the show. Neil, welcome to Pocket Mastermind. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I, yeah, I really appreciate it. Hey, welcome. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So we're going to talk um, a lot about investment today and different types of investing. Before we get into that, let's learn a bit about you, um, your background, and how you've come to now helping people uh, with their money, money management, money matters, uh, investments, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I'm a money coach. My name's Neil Doig. So my company's called Money Tips, which stands for Tax Investment Property Pension Savings. So I started off in the shipping industry after university, moving tankers around the world, went to night school, got my chartered shipbroking qualification, then moved to gas trading. So buying and selling millions of pounds worth of gas each day. When you go home at night, you turn on your heating or you turn on your, your cooker. That's, that's natural gas. I used to trade that, buy and sell that around Europe. My biggest daily gain was £940,000 in a day. Wow. It was kind of a crazy day where there was a pipeline. The main pipeline to Norway froze over, so I had to go to Nor- um, France to source that gas. And kind of 12-hour days, eight screens around me, kind of, do I want to be doing this my whole life? And that decision was made for me. I got made redundant, and it gave me an opportunity to actually say, what do I want to be doing with myself? So I looked at my strengths. I'm good at marketing. Uh, markets looking at markets i'm kind of a geography geek so i'm kind of quite good at kind of looking at kind of the mm-hmm. world and kind of study around people and places i became a financial advisor did all my qualifications had a portfolio of clients and then i kind of had a conscious moment where i was like do i really want to be helping high net worth individuals save more tax i thought how many hospital beds could that provide how many school books how many library books so i decided to move to money coaching giving financial guidance giving education really helping people and un- help them make themselves give themselves to kind of empower them to make their own decisions around money rather than paying someone to do that for you it's investing is simple mm-hmm. it's not easy you can just do real simple things real and just giving them guidance education i wrote a book called millennial money mindset it was shortlisted by the financial times and i've created my own card game which is it teaches people how to invest around a football theme it's called football formation asset allocation and yeah it's like building your team around your investment team around a football like a football team so talk talk us a bit about that again I, I find that quite interesting because one thing i've often thought right is i know so many people that are massively into um like dream team games every season there's all these dream teams on sky and the newspapers and all the rest of it and the amount of knowledge that people have that play these games quite often, like the the, the data analysis and the uh, the strategy and the statistics and all the rest of it. I think if you just applied that knowledge to money, you could be a trader. <laughs> you know, exactly. That's essentially what the game teaches you. So if you live a good life, you live to 90 years old, like 90 minutes on a pitch. If you score a goal, money goes into your pocket. If you can see the goal, money goes out of your pocket. And 
the secret, the one thing, you, the most important thing you need to understand is asset allocation. How is your money asset allocated? So think of it like the pound coin in your back pocket. That's an asset class. So cash is an asset class. Property, the house you live in, that's an asset class. You can buy businesses, like shares of a business. So shares, and that's an asset class. So, and they all move differently, it's similar to the players on the pitch. So a lumbering centre back moves very differently to a striker. He's quite nimble and quite quick. And essentially, it's about building a team that's right for you. So you, the idea is to have a defence, a midfield, and attack. And each player is like an asset class. And if you're the older you are, you want to have a more defensive strategy because you have less time on the pitch, less time to ride out those ups and downs of the market. If you're younger, if you're 25, you can have a much more attacking formation. And it's building that portfolio around you. It's a great idea. I think it's really ah, good. Thank I you. <laughs> I want to. I want to play the game now. <laughs> yeah, do. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's really fun. We, we did a World Cup every year. We're going to do. It kind of got. Um, I booked the. There's a. I live in Oxford. There's an Oxford Modern Art Museum, and I that kind of space to have this World Cup. But obviously, coronavirus. It's kind of we kind of had to cancel. But yeah, the idea of trying to bring it online now. That's the kind of what I'm working on at the moment to kind of make it real. It's just really fun and interactive. It's, Investing is always seen as quite dry, dull, mm -hmm. and it's just making it really fun, interactive, and kind of interesting. And the, and it's the more you play, the more you learn. Essentially, the more you learn, the more you earn is what we we say. But look, essentially, the way people learn, humans learn, is through play. You, I've got a few teacher friends, and they they tell me like they call it like a, a, a learning pyramid. If you just read something, you you take in about four percent of that information if you are active and kind of if you actually start doing it yourself through experience you learn much more and that's mm -hmm. what the game tries to do. it tries to get people active and interested about investing it's, it's so true with everything in life right even even exercise you, you'll get kids to chase a ball but try and get them to run around or anybody right chasing a chasing a ball or playing some kind of sport is definitely more appealing than just running for no no particular purpose other than running. So you can exactly. always, and the same applies for this kind of thing. And I think what you just touched on there is kind of in, investing can seem quite dry. It also can seem quite distant, right? It kind of completely alien, very daunting. Yeah. If, you know, where, so when you're working with somebody, let's kind of go to this perspective of how, where's, where do you start? Like, how does some, you know, the mindset, I guess, everything from everything from mindset to, you know, particular types of activities, that kind of stuff. Where, where would you start with somebody who's maybe listened to this and, and never invested anything at all, but has, has heard that you kind of really need to be doing that? Because ultimately, investing is the secret to wealth generation. Everyone gets tied up on this, how much money you earn. But if you're burning it, and not investing it you're going to end up as poor as somebody who earns nothing right so let's talk about the the exactly. mindset of the investing yeah you're so true and i think i have a, a simple five-step method that i go through so it's real each step is really simple and so the first step is essentially to, uh, to uh, what i say own yourself first so take ownership so essentially today everyone is an investor so previous generations you didn't even need to know about this sort of thing you didn't have to worry about the ups and downs of the market to, essentially previous generations you would your company would look after you, you would, you would work all your life and your company would invest for you. And at the end of that working life, you get a handshake, carriage clock and a guaranteed income for life. They used to call this an annuity. And essentially today, everyone needs to understand that's now, they used to have these things called defined benefit pensions where you'd have a pension and you'd get guaranteed. You're gonna like have, your final salary pension. There's scheme. essentially very few of these around today. And everyone, if you've got a job, you now are auto enrolled into a pension. So your company will pay into a pension. That's, that's, that law came in a few years ago. And also there's another law that came in called pension freedoms in 2015. And that, may, that basically opened up the whole, this dry pension market that's always been kind of dry and dusty before. And it basically means that you, the individual now is in charge of your, your future, what you're doing with your money. So today, and in previous generations, you could buy a, an affordable house. So what are the house prices in London like? They're insane. Kind of mm -hmm. an average person with an average salary can't afford an average house. It's it's unfortunate. It's the, unfortunately it's the way of the world at the moment. And if you had any money left over, you could put that into a bank and get five percent interest rates. Today, 
interest rates are point is it one percent or literally next to nothing yeah, exactly savings accounts now are around a kind of a half a percent point six if you're lucky it's on a high end. and it's crazy. you're actually losing money because when you take into account inflation so this is the spending power in your back pocket so how much you can buy today is much less than it was in the 70s for instance so today everyone is an investor so that's one of the big points that i want to get across so people I kind of he- put their head in the sand thinking I'm not going to worry about investing. Actually, today, you have to take ownership. You have to be responsible. If you listen to this podcast, then that's great. You're being responsible. You're being proactive. And then it's taking, making that res- be responsible and actually taking. And it, the, the secret is it's really simple. You don't have to worry. You don't have to spend too much time on it. So I essentially, I have a, a five-step method. And at the end of it, essentially, what do you want to be getting is to a point where you just need to spend 90 minutes like a football game Mm -hmm. a year on your investing you you don't need to spend like you don't just you can do as much or as little as possible essentially you can automate it all these you can pay set it up so every month a certain amount of your salary is going into an investing account or a, a savings account and you can if that that happens every month you almost forget about your investing and then you just have to do it once a year come back look at your investment and say are they still in line with where I want to be? Checking your risk profile, et cetera. And yeah, it's simple, but it's not easy. So talk a bit about, from the step on from there then, let's talk a bit about kind of like asset classes as you touched on with the game. And yeah. you gave a couple of examples, but maybe let's talk a bit about different asset classes or different investing investment strategies. Yeah. Um, so in case anyone's not really aware of the opportunities and what the difference is between them. Yeah, so I think it's about 11. Well, there's 11 players on the pitch, so I won't go through all of them. But essentially, you want a defence, a midfield, and an attack. So a defence, cash, prop- so the pound coin in your back pocket, property. So your left back is like bonds. So bonds are, always seem to be really boring, but that's where you're lending money to companies or government. So your grand might have bought you premium bonds when you were a kid, which is quite a defensive asset. Where That's where you're lending money to the UK government, and they will give you a certain amount of every year they will get kind of prize money. So that's a defensive asset. Whereas you've got, so trackers is like tracks the market up and down. And this is like a winger. So it tracks the, the market up and down. And that's quite um, a low time, low, low thought kind of, it just literally tracks the market. And then on the other winger is like a commodity. So commodities are really volatile. So I used to trade gas and they move up really fast. So think of, I would class Bitcoin as a commodity now or gold or things like wheat. So when you eat your wheat bix in the morning, that's, that is a commodity and that's your kind of wingers. And then your strikers are growing countries and growing companies. So think of these, like you've got what you call the fangs. So these are like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. That's the kind of the acronym they use. Mm-hmm. So think of these, like these, think of Facebook, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, this is, or even like, yeah, 20 years ago, it was, next to nothing it was kind of an idea in mark zuckerberg's dorm room and this has kind of grown into kind of a monster and this is a, this kind of growth now and you've got like amazon netflix these kind of companies that have grown massively and that's a kind of kind of higher risk higher reward so these companies are going to more likely to get you goals but then they're more likely to concede goals these kind of tech stocks can be quite volatile so that's one striker your other striker is growing countries so they call these the BRICS is the other analogy, um, acronym they use, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Imagine China uh, 10, 20 years ago. It was classed as kind of a developing country. It seemed to be, whereas now it's kind of a huge monster of a country, it's second biggest economy in the world. India, another one. These kind of massive growth in these countries have been amazing. And these are kind of almost now not really emerging markets, which is deemed emerging market. They're almost now kind of, the more developed but there are other kind of like the african nations are going to be huge look at vietnam look at kind of um i don't know cuba would be another interesting kind of very high risk you, they're growing countries that are going to more likely to get you goals but you if you can take the like, almost like there might be a big loss as well there so it's it's about essentially my point is have a balanced portfolio yeah. and you can pick the strategy depending on what you want in life if what about things like um, <clears throat> dividend paying stocks or value stocks, you know, like the Ben Graham, Warren Buffett school of kind of buy, buy, uh, buy, buy a dollar for 50 cents type. 
approach. So that's your right back. So dividend stocks is your right back, so, as in that's the defence. But it's, so yeah, essentially depends on what you're looking to do. So yeah, it's essentially with my clients, it's all about understanding asset classes. Once once you can picture these, like you say, value stocks in your mind and say, actually, I am. You might be really low risk. So you actually, I don't want these emerging markets in my portfolio. So I only want kind of blue chip companies which are more defensive if that mm -hmm. makes sense so you, you touched on dividends so why are dividends more or kind of these i call them these kind of bigger companies the kind of blue chip companies these are ones that provide a utility so what is a utility so think so think of like water think of electricity think of medicine these are things that you need so it's different between needs and wants so even in recession so we're in kind of the depths of a recession at the moment so people still need medicine so if you look at kind of medicine stocks they've been doing really well or water stocks or yeah these are kind of defensive people always need these e even in the depths of recession so having these in your portfolio it's interesting when you and then when you talked a bit about the emergency um, emerging um countries are you talking yeah. around kind of uh, index tracker type funds when you're when you're talking about other countries and, and I guess one other specific question is around, do you then look for uh, currency, so UK currency trackers for, for emerging markets? So that's a great question. So today it's never been easier, simpler or cheaper to invest. So today you can invest in these low cost index funds and that's brilliant. You pay literally next to nothing compared to going to a financial advisor where you're going to pay hundreds of thousands of pounds over 20 years time. So you can, you can make it really simple, cheap and easy. So the, to actually do this today is, is really easy. So yeah, you can go online and buy any of these, anything you want really. And yeah, so it's, it's never been simpler or easier. So it's, it's more about understanding. So what I add value to people is essentially understanding each asset class and how it works for you. And then it empowers a person to make their own decisions around money. And you said another another part of the question. Sorry, remind me what. Uh, and 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 looking at currency. So ah, okay, yeah. One of the challenges. So I'll give you an example. I w I used to work for an American based company, and I have I still have stock in that company. It's a privately held company, so you you can't trade that on the open market. So it goes whenever. Now, as you see the um, U.S. dollar devaluing and the pound up at was it 141 or something today as we record this then that has a significant impact to my uh, the value of of my stock holding and the same you know is true if you're then going to go and trade on the open market that you can buy you know one of the challenges i think we face in the uk is a lot of the attractive as you mentioned like the fangs they're us based right so you're then trading on the New York Stock Exchange or the or, or any of the US um, exchanges, which means you've then got the extra risk of currency. So maybe talk a bit about that. So it's all about having a diverse portfolio. So one of the five steps is diversify. And there's a number of different evidence-based research that I've done. Mathematicians that are much cleverer than I am have come up with these theories of what a guy Harry Malkovich won a Nobel Prize in the 1990s for coming up with the modern portfolio theory. And that's essentially what my game is based on. And essentially it's having a, a diverse portfolio. So there's a really good book called Own the World. And essentially it's about owning, if you own the world, then it doesn't matter about the different fluctuations about having, you can own US stocks, you can own Asian stocks, you can own many different um, different countries. And essentially it's about having as long as you have a diverse portfolio, then the ups and downs almost out kind of balance each other out. If you're talking about coming back to the game, essentially part of the cash would be kind of your Forex. So you can essentially, if you want, you can essentially trade the different Forexes depending on if it's pound, dollar, you know, yen, et cetera. And, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of kind of trying to play the currency market. It's not my style, but it sounds like you are. It's essentially just about picking what's your what's right for you, essentially. So if you want to be playing the kind of forex market, then that's a strategy that you can you can use yeah. yourself. It's more from my perspective. It's more around you know when you look at the kind of the attractive uh, 
businesses. So when people are looking at, you know, the stuff that gets headlines at the moment and things like Tesla and Netflix and Zoom and Facebook yeah. and Google and, and Amazon and, you know, the, the, all of the, basically the, the, the S and P 500, that's really kind of dominated by, you know, five to 10 real players but those are the kind of the global organ, the global businesses, the growth stocks that, you know, touched on before that get a lot of the press are all U S based. And so your risk, you kind of thing you've got to bear in mind is that when you're buying um, on a U.S. market, you've got the, you've got two risks to manage, right? You've got the, the, the fact that the, the, the value of the stock could go up and down, but also the fact that the dollar and the pound values also fluctuate. So, the stock could go up, but if the dollar devalues, you could end up net, you know, net zero or still losing money. And if that was a long-term trend, it's just more variables to bear in mind, I think, rather than yeah. just going and buying. Totally. No, I a hundred percent agree. I, I would say don't buy one stock or don't buy just one test or don't buy zoom, buy a basket of goods. You can save yourself 60%. So mathematicians are much cleverer than I and worked out that you can reduce your risk by 60% whilst getting the same gains by only buying a basket of companies coming back to your us question we in the uk tend to get drawn towards the usa and we forget about i mean japan i've done got J japanese stocks and it quite quietly sits in the background and it just churns away really nicely like there are other countries like china is growing massively it's now become the second biggest economy in the world south korea is it's you know it's massive it's grown massively there's you know southeast asia there's the world's a wonderful place and i think we tend to get kind of caught up in our own uk bias especially and so a lot of our media rob rupert well rupert murray i guess is australian but a lot of the we kind of get caught up in the kind of the us noise maybe and getting caught up in the kind of what good stock to buy and yeah coming yeah i guess i'm coming back to having a ba balanced portfolio maybe i'm sounding like a, a broken <laughs> i think it's a good message to get across though right i mean yeah, ray, yeah you know ray dalio talks a lot about this with his all weather portfolio yeah exactly he kind of kind of created for his own purposes was it back in the mid 90s i think to, because it, the question came to him as and for anyone who doesn't know who ray dalio is he, he founded bridgewater associates which is the I think it's still technically the largest hedge fund on the planet. And yes, the question really was principles as well. Yeah, really, really good book, principles. And the question came up or kept coming up, I think, you know, as he as Bridgewater grew and as he got wealthier and obviously getting older in the mid nineties, the question came up as uh, well, where would you put all of your wealth when you're not around to manage it anymore? Because obviously he's he's had a bit of a Midas touch for quite a long, you know, for 30 years. And so the question was then well, how do you, how are you going to manage it when you're not around? And so that's where Bridgewater, him and his Bridgewater associates um, kind of investment teams came up with this all weather portfolio, which is pretty much as you describe, you know, emerges in mar emerging markets, commodities, um, you know, equities. Uh, and he's massively in bonds. So he's, I think he's in bonds. Yeah. And it's, and it depends on what he's, his customers or clients are quite older. So he yeah. has, it's more of a bond based portfolio which is more defensive where mm -hmm. I, I would be guessing that the listeners here would maybe be 25 to 45 year olds and you could have more of an attacking portfolio than having i think you said like 40 percent in bonds which is quite bond heavy but it's it's building what's right for you as well and it's also to do with so my book it's called millennial money mindset if you want the fruits you need the roots and essentially it's also to do with mindset as well if life's about living as well you don't want to be stressed and worried about the market falling if you've it depends on your risk your own risk profile so if you are a beginner investor and you see in the evening news that the market's gone down 10 percent, and you'll be feeling stressed about that as many people would you you might want to have a more defensive portfolio because then you can essentially you want to be able to sleep at night you don't want to be you know life's about living you don't want to be sat worried not being able to sleep at night just because you're trying to get chase higher gains so it's about what's right for you and it's making a decision that's having a portfolio that's right for you and it, coming back to that um, um diversity mm -hmm. 
I mean, having, having a diverse portfolio, it reduces your risk. So, and you're going to have much more peace of mind. You're going to be able to sleep at night. You're going to be, I've got a portfolio that's pretty diverse. And even during the Corona crash, it's, you see how much, I don't know how much the markets fell from top to bottom, maybe 20% or something. But if you've got money in bonds or you've got money in gold, you've got money in property, it doesn't necessarily matter about what the media are saying. It's about having, it gives you so much peace of mind and so much confidence that you're not going to be stressing and worrying about markets going up or down. Yeah, I think it's true. And the psychology is huge, particularly when you first start. Because I think when you start to invest, you will look at the fluctuations all day, every day. <laughs> it's just, it's human nature. That That's why, that's why uh, a lot of people on the trading floor tend to um, rate quite highly on the psychopathic scale because <laughs> you kind of have to be able to detach yourself away from those crazy fluctuations and make cold decisions, right? So that's quite interesting. So I, I think there's a big difference between trading, trading and, and investing. I, I was a trader for, for, I traded gas for seven years and I, I was a financial advisor giving financial advice to clients. And there's a big difference. So mm-hmm. YouTube channel called Millennial Money Mindset. Check that out. And I essentially explain the differences. So investing is very much like football, simple, easy. Money goes into your pocket, you score a goal, money goes out of your pocket and you you concede a goal, you lose a goal. Whereas trading is much more nuanced. It's much more different and things that make sense quite often don't. So quite often you get companies that release their annual reports or their quarterly reports that does really, that's, really well but then the stock goes down and essentially the traders almost trying to out think the market and they're trying they play these games and there's lots of other kind of they you do things like options and um swaps and they they, it's much more complex and it's much more like rugby so rugby it's a bit like if you kick a ball the the ball moves you know it's a Mm -hmm. ball and it moves about and it's much more complicated and yeah, so essentially try and understand the difference between investing which most people 99% of people should start off investing if you're, we mentioned earlier that if you're putting money into your, your auto enrolled into a pension, that's investing. You're not going to touch that until you're 60. Whereas today it's almost like a tech, uh, the technology day has kind of come on where it's almost so easy to buy and sell stocks. So you can do it on an app and you can literally buy and sell in seconds. And it's almost like a unhealthy mentality because you're buying and selling. It's not going to make you wealthy over the long term. It's going to make these companies that are, these app companies are making a fortune because every time you buy and sell there's a thing called the bid offer spread which is essentially the difference between the buy and the sell and they are encouraging you to buy and sell lots of times because over the long term it's you're going to be losing out because all that money is essentially going to be eroding slightly because you the more you buy and sell essentially the more you're going to lose out it's, if you look at statistics there's loads of evidence to base all this up so essentially, yeah, I would, that's a, I would kind of, if you're, lear- if you're learning and just starting out, to understand there's a difference between investing and trading. I'm not, there's neither right or wrong. You can make a lot of money trading, but yeah, understanding there's a, there's a big difference between the two. Yeah. And I think was, that's what I was saying, you know, as you go into it to begin with, you kind of, it takes a bit of getting used to, to get your mindset into this being a long-term thing. So like you say, you can see fluctuations, quite significant in some weeks right you see the whole you see a market drop five ten percent and then it suddenly bounces back up and it can be you know and and like another another you know as you say things that don't make sense that do make sense and things like you know coronavirus is a great example the market dropped whatever it was 20 percent pretty quickly and then because of the printing of money in the states in particular that market yeah. came back super fast even yeah. though huge numbers of people are out of work and everyone knows that there's a big problem, but there's cash and there's lots of cash and that has to go in, that has to go somewhere. And by definition, it's all going into that market, which then brings it back up. And I think that's an interesting observation for anybody who was watching that. The challenge then comes into, well, at what point does there, does, does the bow wave end yeah, <laughs> and do we start to see the, the drop off again? And I think we're starting to see it a bit in the last week or so with some of the tech stocks are, are kind of pulling back a little bit now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a difficult one. I, I would say the title of my book, if you want the fruits, you need the roots. And it's more about, it's like planting a seed and it's going to grow. Over time. You can't rush 
an oak tree out of a seed. It's got to take time to grow. And that's, that's essentially to grow. Coming back to, yeah, where I think, yeah, the stock money printing, 100% I agree with you, there's, and it kind of coincide with the US election where they kind of printed loads of money and yeah, that flooded the market and it pushed the price up. There's a big disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street, the streets of London and the city, the city of, yeah, the, between the city of London and the towns and villages around England. So I think there's a big, big disconnect. And is this going to, how, how well is this going to end? I don't know. I think, yeah, it kind of lulled us into a full sense of security on that it, it kind of bounced back so, so much. But um, yeah, I've kind of moved away from my trading where you're trying to predict the market. And yeah, I'm more into yeah, long-term investing, buying good quality assets that are going to pay you an income over time. But, um, but there's, there's also an argument for part of your portfolio. This is more advanced, but you could, if you're worried about that, if you're stressed and worried about that, you, part of your, that could be, you could short the market. You could make money by it going down. I'm not saying I'm not recommending this, but there's, there are options out there. If you're part of your portfolio could be, actually, I'm going to put 1% of my overall portfolio, my net, my net worth into a, that's a money that's going to short the market. I mean, there are options. It's for me, it's more about peace of mind. It's about, I think life is for living and it depends on what, where you are in your lifestyle. If I was maybe 10 years younger, I would be like, actually, no, I want to learn about investing. I'm actually just trying to get as much experience as I can. And I want to play the markets and that's fine. That's, I'm not saying there's, there's no right or wrong here. I'm just saying, there's different strategies for different people. If you're, but yeah, if you're going down a trading route, I would say only risk 4% of your net worth. So count up how much your assets are worth and only take 4% is a good number. It's a finger in the air number. It's not, that's not a recommendation. That's not advice. That's just guidance. But don't be betting the house on a stock market crash, if that's what I mean. So just- Or, or the other way, or, or the alter, or the, in the other direction. <laughs> exactly, because- yeah, because the things that you can't, I guess, investing, it's what you can control and what you can't control. So you can't control what the Fed's going to do. They, there's a, these, and now what they say, like, don't fight the Fed. You, they, they might come out and say, right, we're going to print another, you know. Another trillion dollars, yeah. Printing, you, you just don't know. It's, mm. So yeah, understanding what you can control, you can control your asset allocation. And that's where it comes to mindset. The one thing you can control is your mind and what your decisions you make. And then, so I talk about your inner game is your like your mindset. Then your outer game is your asset allocation and how you allocate those assets depending on, you can be tactical. You can be quite strategic about where you want to be in life. If you're, I've got some clients who are really ambitious and they're right. I've got these like, I'm not saying, yeah, high goals they want to set. And so they, they're happy to take more risk because they're, they're fine taking the ups and downs of the market. Where I've got other clients where I've spoke to, they're like, I don't, I don't want to know about the market. I don't want to, when I see a 20% fall, I know in myself that I'm going to be stressed out and worried. I don't want that on my weekend where I work hard all week and I don't want that. So then they can take a much more defensive strategy. And it's all about you. So today it's great. We're all individuals and you as an individual can make a decision on where you're going to be with your investments yeah and it's just go, it's go in and you know go slowly and educate yourself because what what i think again to go back to the noise that we see a lot of what we hear is more trading behavior and mentality rather than investing so people yeah. get their their app um whatever there's trading two on two or robin hood which seems to be kind of like fashionable at the moment yeah. and they're buying and selling like you say right and and that's not investing that's kind of with unconsciously trading without any just following maybe you're following the reddit stuff or you're following yeah. whatever you're following it's um it's a dangerous path to follow because it's doing anything that's quite complex like that is uh, without education is going to be challenging and i think you know go back to ray dalio he said the average person trading will not beat them beat the professionals right they they've got such sophisticated technology uh, proprietary technology and indicators that allow them to make decisions and they still get it wrong so the chances yeah. of someone sat at home in their bedroom with probably 15 minute delayed data <laughs> being able to trade effectively is, is pretty much zero 
Yeah, I think it's 74% of people lose money on, they call them CFDs, these contracts for difference. But this is super dangerous where essentially you're leveraging your, your trading. It's a bit like taking a mortgage out where you're, you put down you know, 20% and the bank will lend you money. You're, the broker will give you money to trade. And essentially this is what caused the 1930s crash. Mm -hmm. People were borrowing money to speculate essentially. And this is where it, it won't end well. I think there are ways to to beat the market if essentially there are if you look at Warren Buffett's a classic um Peter Lynch is a really interesting one where he said have a specialist skill like understand he says that if you the the poet the surfer and the carpenter know more about the certain things than the city broker or the the, the analyst who's just sitting looking at a spreadsheet there are some ways to mm -hmm. to look at actually this is overpriced or this is underpriced or he talks about having a specialist knowledge. So if you, if you say, I don't know, if you're really interested in, I don't know, like board games, you could find a company and actually think, oh, that might be a little bit underpriced because you know that there's going to be a huge launch coming up. Or you might be really into, I don't know, you might be a biologist and you might think, oh, these, this CRISPR stocks are, there's loads of government funding that's going to come up in one or two, three years. But yeah, that's going more down the tra trading route. And I'd say, yeah, Oh, yeah, I, yeah. It, not, I think the, the, what you're saying there is 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 important. You know, <clears throat> stuff that you're knowledge about, knowledgeable about, and interested in, makes a lot more sense than trying to go. This is where the challenge with a lot of the tech stock is. Like, most of us have got no idea how those businesses operate, <clears throat> and like, so Warren Buffett has always said, like, you don't have to be very, you don't have to be very bright to do what yeah. he does because. He just goes after stuff that's really easy. You know, the Coca-Cola example for him was like, I know how much a can of Coke is. If you add 10 cents to the can of Coke and I know how many cans of Coke they sell, I know how much more money they're going to make. <laughs> yeah. It's a very, very easy business model. Whereas, you know, Microsoft, him and Bill Gates have been friends for decades and he's never invested in Microsoft because he's like, I don't understand the business. Yeah. Yeah. Warren Buffett is, yeah, I'd say like, yeah, one of my heroes. I th actually, he, one of your questions was who would be you'd like to spend a day with. That would be, yeah, I'd think, like, kind of speak to him and see his, what his strategy is. But he's he's very he's done very well. But his long term strategy, kind of these, his his strategy is thirty percent small growing companies and seventy percent value companies, which is quite interesting. His his kind of strategy. He used the analogy of a snowball. Is if you look at there's a book written about it. It's like like I don't know, like thousands i think there's like a thousand pages or something and it just says like start off small like think of it like a snowflake land in your hand is like your your paycheck that you you get every month and each month it builds up and then as you push it you it starts building up over time and before you know it I've, after a few years it if you ever pushed as a kid if you ever pushed a snowball when it's been snowing and it grows and grows and grows and soon it's got the size of your head you know it's as tall as your head and that's just real doing simple stuff ev consistently and that's essentially that's all you to do with investing just pay yourself every month I, consistently into the in, build up that net worth and then you'll be amazed at how quick that builds up over time and then I, I guess I love talking about the kind of the strategy kind of side I get caught up talking about the Peter Lynch's and specialization but like having a specialized knowledge but yeah doing the simple stuff first getting a foundation there before you move on to the the, the, the kind of trading and kind of picking the winners I think everyone everyone loves well i can talk about that kind of stuff for for hours but um yes yeah, doing the basics first yeah. you kind of get into the kind of the, the kind of more clever stuff if that makes sense and on that so how like how much would, does someone need to get started with investing because I, I guarantee there'll be people listening to this now and i've heard it a million times they go well that's all good but i haven't got any money to invest so pound coin in your back pocket is all you need so essentially one of the steps of the five-step method is to have an emergency fund so you want to be having a cash buffer so you don't want to be investing your money that you're going to be needing within five years so you want to have a cash buffer so in case anything goes wrong your car breaks down you need to pay that to go to work or you know if you've owned if you own a house the boiler breaks down you don't want to be you don't want to be selling when the market's down you want to have enough cash buffer but essentially it's just start as soon as you I would say you can start as, as soon as you can, like a one pound in your, your back pocket. It's never been simpler, easier or cheaper to start investing. Just drip feed it into the market. By drip feeding, I mean just 
every month have think of it like a bill just you, you know you pay your gas bill you pay your heat you pay your electricity bill unfortunately today that you have to have your investment fund so think of, I, you can call it whatever your freedom fund or whatever you want to call it that where you're paying every, every month and that's eventually going to build up enough assets that are going to pay you an income for when you stop working so the i the, the end goal is essentially become financially independent so f- there's a number of movements that I'm, I'm on that i'm in a number of kind of online forums that they call it the fire movement i don't know if you heard of this but mm-hmm. fire independent and retire early but essentially the idea is to pay yourself enough assets that are going to pay you an income for where you stop working and that opens up cho- your choice and freedom to spend your time doing what you want to do you can still work but you can work for joy rather than working for necessity and it gives you that kind of freedom and option to yeah to do something you love or do something meaningful with your life have more purpose in your life rather than having if you if you wait to invest then you're always going to be reliant on that paycheck you're always going to be you're going to, it's all like i say own be own yourself first take be your owner be your you want to be having be the ceo of your own life and i think you asked how much you need so essentially i i, I can imagine people at home think ah oh, but that's easy said than done essentially it's spend less than you earn which is sounds easier than it is in practice yeah it's, it's quite difficult for you know there's a there's a lot of things enticing you to um spend more than you earn right particularly yeah. as everything's become a subscription service these days yeah so think of it like an hour of your time so every you go to work for eight hours so one hour your first hour that you work in your day should be to yourself so you why are you working you're working to give yourself and your family a better life so that first hour should be to yourself. So that should be paying yourself first into a savings account or an investment account. And then don't touch that. And when it comes down to the mind, mindset, it's so easy to say, but actually to do that in practice, it's it's quite challenging. It's particularly, you know, when, when, you've, when you've developed a habit over quite a number of years, um, and, you know, we're just not taught this stuff. You know, the thing that kind of bugs the hell out of me is, of all of the things we get taught at school, money management and kind of health and nutrition, the two, two of the probably the primary things you could you need um, are not taught. And it could be easily done through maths lessons and, you know, apply, using applied maths rather than just kind of counting, you know, blocks and, and, and you know, tens and twenties and that kind of stuff. It's like actually put that into a real world example. Talk about how to manage money and use maths in that 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 perspective because we've got to start educating people from a younger age like you touched on earlier you know as you get past 40 50 your time on the pitch is running out and i think there's a great example i I saw a working example if you were uh, i think 20 and if you invest like a thousand pounds and then a hundred pounds a month every month after that until you're uh 30 something like that by the time you're 65 you've got 1.6 million quid Right. You just you, all you got to do is invest for those 10 years at 100 pounds and your salary will probably go up and you don't need to increase the amount you're investing. But the power of the compounding interest exactly. is so strong and we're just not taught yeah. compounding interest. I think you touched on a good point as well. Actually, there's so many things enticing us. So advertisers these days, you get this, the smartest guys from the best universities trying to encourage you or writing the program that's going to have the adverts going to sell you the most. It kind of plays on your heartstrings or it kind of encourages you to be like have the you know the, the picture of the happy family and then they have their product and it kind of links the two of kind of connection and this product and it makes us feel as oh we need to have we need to buy this product we need to have buy more things because it will make us feel good it's and these chemicals get released in our brain when we buy something and i think the biggest challenge that i see at the moment is the, the kind of the debt spiral. I think this, the, the amount of people in debt, it's, it is amazing how, yeah, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges I think our generation face of this kind of debt spiral where once you get into it, it's, it's like a, it's so difficult to get out. And yeah. it's, yeah, it's kind of the advertisers who kind of encourage us to spend and make it easy. And yeah, it's, and it's, again, you mentioned compound interest, which, we talk about mass loads and it's it's almost overdone but it's yeah super powerful and if you've got compound interest working against you it's just it's like swimming against the tide and you're going to be it's going to wear you out so much more by you know right if you've got compound interest 
and working with you it's like you can almost sit back and let the current take you along and it's going to make it's going to make your life so much easier and it's going to make your you know it's all about ha- comes back to happiness it's going to make your life happier because you're not going to be stressed and worried about these th- that bill landing on your doormat and opening it that sea of red of like how much money you owe you owe to to a credit card company like who like who are you owned by you're basically owned by a credit card company because your paycheck goes to them each month rather than going into your own pocket each month yeah and talking on that kind of you know as we talk about compound interest i think we kind of a lot of people think about it in money in monetary terms right but it's it's everything money is the result of the habits that you have before the money if that makes sense right so yeah. so talk about you know as we're coming towards uh the end of this co- this conversation we're gonna have to have many more because <laughs> we could probably okay. talk for days um but you know talk about some of the, the the maybe the positive habits that you've adopted in your life that have you know that, that you feel serve you and, and and maybe someone could benefit from yeah so with the money thing automating is massive i think i did read like the richest man in babylon and i just it took me maybe like half an hour like just to work just click click a few and have it automate and i just didn't think about it again and like 20 years time i look at my net worth and like, i didn't really do anything complicated i mean i did a few things but even if i didn't do anything complicated like that money every month you're amazed at that coming back to that snowball analogy of just like pushing it every month you don't have to think or worry about it anymore it's just done for you i mean it's i'm maybe talking more people who are in a long-term job and have that ability to you know have an, a regular income every month it may be trickier if you're a business owner but automation is massive like you can do that so easy set that up Coming back to good habits, I've, I'm a massive fan of a morning routine. It's almost like cl- quite cliche, and like you, I've listened to podcasts and they have like this guava juice from the Himalaya mountains. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> essentially, as soon as I get up, just I do. Like, I call them like power hours, where like, the first two hours is like my highest value task, which has been writing my book, Millennial Money Mindset. If you want the fruits, you need the roots. So I would never have had that book if I didn't set up that that kind of power hour. And just those two hours of focus, and I'm a big fan of this. I don't know if you read the book Flow by I can never pronounce a guy's name, but it's it's the concept of flow and getting into that kind of. It's all a bit like um, you know getting in the zone as a kind of athletes, mm-hmm. um, where you, I just set a timer, put music in for an hour hour of work, and d- just focus on that. Not going checking my emails and kind of. There's another really good book called deep work and he talks about kind of rather than doing these kind of shallow tasks of checking your emails or kind of that focusing on this kind of deep work and that's where most of the value is going to be added if you look at the kind of the jobs that are going to be high value jobs in the future these they're going to be doing these kind of deep work tasks where the high you know, impact tasks so yeah that was massive for me this yeah this this, this kind of morning routine it's, it doesn't have to be complicated but it's just you don't even have to think about it. You just get up. You you know that's the first thing you're going to do, rather than kind of yeah. You know, I think a lot of energy is wasted, kind of thinking what should I do next. And if if you know straight away, then you're in the morning. For me anyway, I guess it's working out your your kind of circadian rhythm or whatever. You know, you're where you are the most productive. But for me, the morning is that's kind of where I'm kind of peak. And yeah, having that more morning routine has been super super powerful for me. Yeah, I agree. I think. And it starts with knowing what you're what you're expecting to do, right? I think for so for me, one of the things was planning my week. Like yeah. on a Sunday, taking half an hour, maybe an hour, but mostly it's probably about half an hour it takes to go, okay, well, what are the things I need to get done this week? Um, yeah. and then kind of you know, uh, pencil them in for each day. Sometimes you don't know how long a task's gonna take. And I think we try and put too much in. And I certainly did this when I first started kind of managing my own my time better was i put in eight things to try and do on a monday and realize you get one done or half of that one thing done yeah. because it might be doing something you've never done before or it might be reliant on uh information or or interaction from elsewhere that you're not able to get for whatever reason right so but i think try and as you said there that kind of prioritizing your key tasks early on is incredibly powerful because if they do overrun and you get, you know, maybe you're in the flow, you can carry on. Whereas if you start to try and put important things at the end of the day, for me personally, 
you see, start to get a bit more tired or other things get in the way. You know, anything could happen between nine yeah. o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning and four or five that could mean you don't get to that in, important task. And, you know, for me, things like I'm my girlfriend's Greek and I'm trying to learn Greek at the moment. So now I have one Greek lesson every morning is one of the first things that I do. Cause when I put it at the end of the day, guess how many times I did them. Exactly. <laughs> Zero. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta know yourself and manage yourself. Exactly. Stephen Covey used a really powerful analogy. I, lo I love my analogies. And he usually says like, he has like um, a glass and he has three rocks and he puts the rock, you know, he first, and he has these pebbles and he first of all puts the pebbles in first, these kind of small tasks. And then obviously then he puts the, the big rocks in afterwards and it doesn't fit into the glass. But if you, he then does the other one where he puts the the big rocks in first and then he, and then he which you your kind of big important task put do those put those in first you've got a glass which is your the analogy is your day you've only got a certain amount of you know hours in a day and then he pours in the small pebbles afterwards and these kind of small tasks kind of fill around these kind of big tasks so yeah know your big your big tasks essentially i think what you said plan beforehand is really good and then yeah then it, you, you get your your, your day will kind of you at the end of the day you're like i've actually achieved these big tasks rather than you know having these small pebbles that you might not you've answered lots of emails but not actually achieved anything yeah just they're just busy for being busy's sake and i think you know we partly learn that in the corporate world because the corporate world is full of busy for busy sake rather than outcomes because yeah if you actually just tracked all of the outcomes you'd be lucky if you got one per day per person it's a lot of meetings and conversations and email checking and all of this exactly. stuff that, and i think it's you kind of get conditioned to living that way like it's kind of it's different so it takes a bit of a while to get out of that and if you're you know if you're looking if you're somebody who's currently in a in a job and looking to kind of maybe break out and do your own thing then it's a great time to practice by using your bookend in your day. Obviously, if you're, if you're working during the day to make that morning time really useful and really productive. And then if you've still got energy in the afternoon, when you come home or the evening, use that time, but get into the habit of thinking about outcomes rather than tasks. Task lists are a terrible like to-do list. The traditional to-do to -do, to -do list is call someone. It's not the outcome of the call, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really important to try and get your head around outcomes, in my opinion. Yeah, super powerful. Um, if you, on this kind of subject, and before we kind of wrap up, if you could go back to your younger self and give yourself one piece of advice from the things you've learned from where, you know, the journey has taken you to where you are now. Yeah. What do you reckon that would be? Ah, uh, great question. It's difficult. I, I think education is super powerful super important so today it's never been easier to get mentors or coaches that you can get an audiobook and just listen to the um, you know on your your walk to the bus station or the walk to the train this kind of almost like dead time where you wouldn't be doing anything otherwise you can actually just listen to you know some of the greats like i'm a big fan of kind of stoic philosophy i use some of that work in my book so these kind of ancient you know people in a thousand or was it two thousand years ago you can like marcus aurelius meditation he's like one of the most, cool. um yeah, the, yeah influential oh, okay. persons in history and you can almost you can buy a book that he written 2000 and listen to it on your way to work yeah. youtube's amazing like the amount of information and quality of people you can listen to a lecture that's um that's been recorded you know from one of the greats many years ago and you can listen to that today so yeah just using that information and I guess actually taking action from it. I think that's really interesting what you said about outcome rather than task. So I'm guilty of being massively procrastinating. I always have loads of stuff that, yes, yeah, so actually getting stuff done, taking action. Don't just listen and actually actually do it and actually yeah, make sure that you get the outcome. Yeah, it's, it's an easy trap to fall into. And I, I've definitely done it and still do, right? From time to time, I'll be, I'll read a book and then read the next book and then read the, <laughs> read the next book. And it's quite easy to do that without, to, without implementing. And actually, you probably get further by reading three or four books in a year and taking action from them than trying yeah. to fall into this trap of emulating Bill Gates and read a book a, a, book a week or, you know, some other people that try and claim a book a day. It's just, it's bonkers. Exactly. I'm going down the same track as you actually. I used to read loads, like 
get through loads of books, but I've come back to actually finding really good books that almost like a mentor. And I think mm. a bit like a learning a song. I see your guitar in the background. I've played, I've got a podcast and I've played the intro to the in, intro to my podcast. Mm. Essentially, it. learning a song. So it's much better to like master one or two songs and play that all the time rather than trying. When I first started learning music, I, I'm, a, I'm a terrible guitarist. I'm not very good. I just mess, mess around, but I no, try to <laughs> songs and or you end up actually learning none because you can just play a little little riff or a little yeah. tiny little bit of one piece of song, lots of it. But actually, if you just master one song, like if you're, you know, if you've got, if you go to that party, the kind of the dream of why probably everyone <laughs> yeah. to play that. If you've just learned that one song really well, then that's that's much better than learning a tiny little riff from, you know. 50 songs so it's almost the same as books if you learn like you know master i'm a big highlighter as well i love like highlighting books and make notes just like get really good at one book and the, the key points from that rather than trying to cover 50 books and not learn them very well yeah i agree i think if you can I, i've done exactly what you're doing i kind of went through a read i read loads and loads and now i kind of keep going i've got like a small a small stack of books that I go back to and, and, and a great, a tip I got from Tim Ferriss was creating your own contents page on the inside cover. So when you see something that's, you really impresses you, or, you know, you want to go back to, you can literally just write the page number and what it was on the inside cover. And I found that very, very useful. Yeah, no, I'm, I love highlighting and I make notes and then, yeah, I'm, yeah. You've got to take it in. That's, that's the important thing. So I'm conscious we have um, kind of run over time a little bit here. So before we head off, any final points that you'd like to share with the people listening and also let them know where they can find you? Yeah, hopefully that's been interesting and I've offered value. So I think may, the main point with Diversify was, made the, I guess, the main point we talked about to have a diverse portfolio of different assets so yeah you can get my book millennial money mindset if you want the fruits you need the roots it was shortlisted by the financial times it's bestseller on amazon yeah if you're talking about books yeah please check that out it's, it's essentially each chapter is a story an analogy to make it really fun simple and achievable i've got a youtube channel also called millennial money mindset i've got about 90 videos up there all giving kind of good quality education on there I've got podcast millennial money mindset and yes, yeah, send me send me a message. I've got um, I'm on LinkedIn or Instagram. So uh, my company's called Money Tips. So two P's. So money and then tips. T I P P S. Um, yeah, have a look. And I'm giving away a how to automate. I talk about automation as well. So I've got a course, a free course that I give away to people, um, and it's called How to Automate Your Finances to Give You More Me Time. So send me a message on any of those platforms: LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. It's a 40 minute course aimed to do it in your lunch break or after school. And yeah, it's aimed to kind of automate your finances to give yourself I said, more time in your day to, to live your life. Amazing. Neil, it's been incredible talking to you. Really I enjoyed it. Thanks so much, David. We could definitely, and you're definitely going to have to come back because there's no doubt about it because uh, yeah, there's definitely, more we yeah. can talk about um, through particular, particular types of investments and, uh, you know, updates on where market trends are things that are happening, things that can influence the market. Uh, there's yeah. loads, so much more we can talk about plus just life in general. So um, hopefully you'll come back in the not too distant future and we'll, we'll do it all again. Yeah, it sounds great. Cheers, David. Thanks great. so much. It's been, it's been really good and uh, speak to you again soon. Cheers. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to hear more similar episodes, head over to pocketmastermind.com where you'll also find the links mentioned in this conversation. And if you haven't done so already, please leave us a review. It will really help us to get our message out and let more people know about these episodes. So leave us a review, leave us a rating, hit the subscribe button and please share with your friends. Until next time, thank you again for listening.